Yes, good morning, good morning. Oh, trash? Okay, I'll take trash, thanks. You guys are slow this morning. Pull my skirt down, thank you. Oh, cool, I'm so glad. I missed you guys, I was away for two weeks. Did you miss me? Up, oh, You didn't come, you didn't even know I was missing. Oh my word. I miss you. I miss you. I'm glad to be back. Do you know that song we just sang, God has a purpose and God has a destiny? That's for you. God has a really good plan for your life. And he wants you to discover it. So when you go to class today, you be thinking about God's plan. Because his plan for you is real, no, his plan for you is really good. Yes, his love is deep and wide. Father, thank you for our children, this rich heritage. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for every one of them. I pray, Lord, that they would be open to receiving your plan for them. Lord, that it would begin to stir in their hearts how much you love them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, go to class. Have fun. Go to class. They're waiting for you. Oh, God is so good. Isn't he good? I'll tell you what. Their faces. Oh, you bigger boys didn't let me pray for you, but I bless you anyway. How's that? Catch it on the way out. In Jesus' name. And I saw kids I didn't know today. I need to know these kids. Man, I feel like I'm slipping. Faces I didn't know. Well, I need to just say one tiny little thing about our exciting couple of weeks away. We're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. God has great things, but they're not going to be the same as they've always been. That's a good word. God has great things, not the same as they've always been. And get happy about that. Because the fire is on us for healing, not for destruction. That's a good word, too. Brother, I'm not stealing any more thunder. I'll just be quiet. But anyway, I love you and thank you all for praying for us. All right. Well, let's get excited for, if you don't know him, you're going about to know him. For us who know him. We know that what he shares is from God, and we're excited. Clint Frank, come on. Yes. Come on. Yes. Come on. This guy's like chomping at the bit for a year. When can I preach? When can I preach? When can I preach? <laughs> well, you're preaching, brother. Okay. It's time. So let's extend your hands to this. Come on. God, we thank you that what resides in him is coming out. Whatever it is, Lord, I want it. Do you want it? I want it. Whatever it is, because we know whatever it is, it's life-giving. It's life-changing. So we want it. So I thank you for the anointing on my brother, and we're ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. While I'm getting set up, you can turn to Romans 1. You can turn to Romans 1 if you have your Bible. And while you're going there, if you're taking notes, this is the title, The Fingerprint of God. In Psalms 8, verse 3, David said this. He said, when I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in place. You know, if there was a crime done locally and you were invited to the crime, there was several 
tens of thousand dollars that were stolen and the burglar left and he is no longer there, you're going to go and dust for fingerprints. Because if we can attach the fingerprints to the person that did it, we've got the criminal. We know who did the job. So this is what David's saying. Everything that you see in creation, everything from the farthest galaxy to the tiniest atom, God's fingerprints are all over it. Now, how many of you have ever had a debate with someone about creation versus evolution? Raise your hand if you've had conversations like this. And most of us as believers say, uh, yeah, we believe in God. And then they say, well, can you prove God exists? And we go, uh, well, I don't know, I just have faith, you know, I just believe God, you know. Can you talk to someone who has a four-year degree in a particular area of, int they have a certain intellectual knowledge, can you speak to them in a way that it's going to be, there's going to be evidence of this. So when we look at, we're going to take a look at Romans 1 verse 18, or excuse me, verse 19 and 20. Romans 1 verse 19 and 20. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. God has put his knowledge in their hearts from the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky and all that God has made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so that they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. In this past February, there was a debate on CNN between Bill Nye and who was, who was a scientific evolution, very heavily evolution uh, in the way of thinking for evolution, and Ken Ham, who is the founder of the Creation Research Museum, which is in Florence, Kentucky. And they had about 2.5 million hits on YouTube the next day on this. It was, it was, it was, it was filmed around the world. So it's a huge debate as to, as to whether or not there's the existence of God. And don't think that it's not doubted in the church. Don't think that sometimes as teenagers, they go through times where they go, is there really a God? So when you're having conversation with people, we want to be able to have some ammunition, not to kill them, but just to have some ammunition so that you're ready, as Paul says, to study, to show yourself approved, so that we are using our mind and there's actual evidence in all of creation. Because here's the deal, when it comes to high school, I still remember being in ninth grade in earth and science class, earth and space, and they said, this is a hypothesis of how the world started. This is a hypothesis of how the moon, you know, came into being. Well, the word hypothesis means educated guess. So because they're scientists and they have degrees, the church is kind of, they don't worry about this area. We leave it to the school system. We'll leave it to Discovery Channel. If you hear the word millions of years, I want you to know you're hearing evolution. When they say 65 million years ago, I get a kick out how they can project 55 billion years ago when they can't even predict the weather for this weekend. So when you hear millions of years, you're hearing evolution. Think about Marxism. The foundation of Marxism is that there is no God. Marxism says God is a creation of man. But we are a creation, we are a creation of God. So this starts to divert and pervert a society in, in several, several different ways. So really, here's the deal. If a person, if you do not believe, if a person that you're speaking to does not believe in the existence of God, then you believe that evolution, which is nothing, created everything. So what's in my hand right here, there's at least air in my hands. You believe that that created everything. So literally, there has to be billions of freak accidents, accidents that have happened around the globe, in the sky, everywhere we go. But God says the people, they are without excuse. So if we take a look at the earth, 
You know, one of the theories that's beginning to fade out the door, but it was the Big Bang Theory. You know, let's just, you don't even have to be a believer to think through this. I'm just going to get real practical here. But this is taught as facts in our schools. Matter of fact, teachers will say, my son comes home and goes, yeah, Dad, they're talking about evolution. The teacher will say, I don't believe this, but this is what I have to teach. So the kids never get a chance, unless they go to Dayspring, the kids never have a chance to see what's the other perspective. Because they're not, they're, not, they're, not they're not being taught what the other perspective is. So let's just go over real quickly. The Big Bang Theory is a, con a, con con a condensing of all the molecules, and at a certain point in time, there was an explosion. The explosion then created the earth. This is the theory that they're saying is real. Well, let me ask you a question. The missiles that are flying into Israel and the missiles that are going into Gaza, do they create, are they constructive or are they destructive? An explosion does not create unity. It does not create a system. It creates chaos. So the Big Bang Theory is out the window. It doesn't take, you know, it really doesn't take long once you really start to think through this how it works. I have, I have with me a small globe that I, that I brought and as you see this, the earth, the earth is, is, is at a perfect 23 degree angle. And if we look obviously in Genesis 1, it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we know that. Now, the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. Now, I want you to take a look. I need someone to be a son for me. Matt wants to be a son. Come on up. <laughs> Brother, Pastor Matt, come on up. Now, the sun, stand right here in the center. Okay. Now, I want you to think about God's genius. He did not set the earth at a, he did not put it straight up and down. Do you know why? Because we would have the same seasons, you, we would have the exact same season all year round. But God in his genius set the earth at a perfect 23 degree angle. So here we are in the United States, and right now it's summer, excuse me, it's summer, so I'm going to be on this side. It's summer. No, it's going to be on this side. <laughs> I don't know, it's spinning, which, I don't know which way it's going to be. But in, the, in the, the light that comes to the earth, we have the sun hitting directly. But as we, as we rotate around, it doesn't change. And then we, have, then we have the winter, which is hitting lower on the, on the hemisphere. Now, the heat from the earth, it is set at a perfect distance from the earth. The sun. The sun, is, the sun is set from a perfect distance from the earth. Now, I did a calculation, and let me just have you hold this once, brother. I did a calculation that around the earth it's 24,000 miles around the earth. And if you, there's some people that fly in airplanes 20, 5 million miles. That's 41 laps around the earth. Now, the, the sun is 93 miles, 93 miles away, 93 million miles away. Now, you're going to need to set the sun approximately three quarters of a mile away from the size of this earth right here. Three quarters of a mile is the calculation that I came up with. Now, if you are off by one half of an inch, you're going to, the earth is either going to burn up or it's going to freeze. See, think about, the. see, we're just at a little different place when we go around the sun. We're at a little different place, and we have winter and summer. We have about a 50-degree difference from winter to summer, right? So what if, you know, evolution messed up a little bit, and we were just off by, you know, maybe 100 miles? That's not much in 93 million. We would freeze. It would be 200 degrees below zero. We'd be frozen. If we were closer, it'd be 200 degrees and we'd be burning up. I mean, water boils at 210 degrees. 
So God in his genius, you can either believe that that is a freak accident or it's the fingerprint of God. That he has a plan. You might need to keep holding that, brother. God in his infinite wisdom knew exactly what he was doing. So now we're going to go, now we're going to, go to the moon. Now you can keep holding that. Now if I Google... We have the moon right here. This is a golf ball. It has the texture of the moon. Now somehow, SpongeBob. SpongeBob, yeah, Matt just seen that. Somehow SpongeBob got on a golf ball. I have no idea how that happened, but here it is. Now I, I calculated that the moon would be about 10 feet away like this. The, earth, the, the moon would be about 10 feet away from the earth. Now if you Google nine out of the top 10 answers, how was the earth formed, you will have this answer. There was a large meteorite several billion years ago that struck the earth. It jolted its, its axis. It, it, created, it was a huge meteorite that hit and the, the particles went into the atmosphere. The gases gradually swirled around. They came together to form the moon. Now, if you believe that, I'll tell you another one. Remember, that's taught as fact in our schools. So here's the other one. Crater Lake... There was a redwood tree that sat right in the middle of Crater Lake, and when that meteor struck that area, the redwood tree projected six miles into space. It went into the atmosphere and chose to pick an orbit and circle around the Earth every 27 days. A tree. A tree. Yeah. If you believe that one. That's what they're saying. I mean, think about... Think about what they're saying to us. But David in Psalms says God placed the moon and the stars where he wanted them. It's the fingerprint of God. Yes. Something else very interesting that, that I want to show you is this. Now, you're going to take a look at SpongeBob's face here, Matt. Do you realize that the, the moon, when you look at the moon at night, since you were a child and now, or if you lived in Italy, did you know that we only see one side of the moon? We don't see both sides of the moon. You only see one side. So SpongeBob, watch what happens, Matt. SpongeBob's face is looking right at Matt. <laughs> Now, do you realize as I did that, it turned one time. So like perfect synchronization, the moon, matter of fact, it's probably a little easier to show you with this. If we take this side facing, okay, and we go around, this notebook has turned one time. Every 27.2 days, you see the moon cycle around and you see the same side of the moon. Freak accident or the man, it doesn't take long to blow evolution out of the water. I mean, I try to teach this to the youth group at different points in time because they are, if you go to a public school, public school, they are getting bombarded with this. And I want to know, I want the kids to know how to have an answer, you know, ask the right questions, put the teacher on the spot. You know, instead of going, yeah, we got to teach, you know, you the teachers, yeah. I tried to get into the high school locally, and I said, I will come in and share on intelligent design or create whatever you want to call it. I will come into the school. The teacher was too scared to have me come in because he said I could get in trouble for that. You know, I don't think he could, actually. I, I think I could, you know, we could do that. So we have to, ha we have to study to show ourselves approved. You know, so just to reemphasize this, if we did have these particles swirling around in the atmosphere that decided, it's like telling dirt to make a decision to pull together. You know, if you have, if you have, it doesn't work. Now, if we take this dirt and we're going to put it right here, can it, if we come back next week, is it going to change? If we come back a million years from now? Is it, yeah, is it going to do anything different? We could even have gold or uranium, the smartest minerals in the world, and they're not going to make a decision to pull together 
to create what God put in the heavens as the moon. I think I'm done with you, brother. Thank, Thank you. you. Brother. Whoops, where's my notebook? I left it somewhere. So sometimes you don't even need to be a believer to believe this. You just have to have common sense. Really, think through this. We'll just take a quick look. Take a quick look at the stars. You know, it's amazing when, you know, when I look at the Big, Deep, Big Dipper and I see the seven stars that are in alignment to create that formation. An interesting thing about light years is this. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So if you were to turn a flashlight on and have it go around the world, it would, it would lap the world seven times in one second. So that's how fast light is. So it, take, it would take less than two seconds for light to go from here to the moon. Less than two seconds. And how, how, how many minutes does it take for light to get to, from the earth to the sun? Eight minutes. It's eight minutes that light travels, the speed of light. So if you were to turn the sun off, then turn it back on, it would take eight minutes for you to capture that light with your eye. Now, you want to see how awesome God is. The stars that you see, the Big Dipper, is over four light years away. And some of them are even 10 and 20 light years away. Now, I don't know, you just can't even fathom that in your mind, but I want you to look at your neighbor and say, God is mega awesome. See, in Psalms, David is saying, he talks a lot about creation. So he worships God, but he's also, he's also glorifying him as creator. So, you know, the next time you're standing in church and you're singing, Our God is an awesome God. What time is it? He reigns from heaven above. Man, my legs are sore with wisdom, power, and love. You just think about how mega awesome God is. Mind-blowing. And that's, you know, this stuff's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, this is an incredible study to just begin to look at God's creation because he's left his fingerprints for us, for everyone, for all humanity. Something very interesting, you know, we talk about Noah's flood and you can connect the flood to fossils. How does something get fossilized? What creates fossilization? If you see a dead animal along the road and you drive by after a few weeks, it will typically decay and you will have, you know, predators that will eat it and the bones will be gone and it's, it's done, that's it. So why do we have millions of fossils, even billions of fossils around the world? From the flood. You know, I, I've watched, I watched things on YouTube where houses, during a flood, houses were literally floating down rivers. You know, there's an incredible amount of power in floods, and without going into a lot of detail, there was a tremendous amount of water. It said that the flood covered the highest peaks in the, in the, in the world. So when things would be buried, things, the amount of mud and dirt that would have been moved, things would have been instantly buried. Two things. Fossilization occurs because things are frozen and because there's no oxygen that can get to it. It's an instant burial. It was an instant burial ground during that time. So we have fossils all over the world. And the, the interesting thing is, if evolution were true, we would find the transitionary forms that they're talking about. In other words, you know, the chickens that turned into lizards and the, the dinosaurs that turned into turkey. You know, whatever that we don't find transitional forms. See, here's the way it works. In Genesis, it says, it says God created the animals, each one after their own kind. So let me just be real practical here. When a mice has a baby, he has a, it has a baby mouse. She has a baby mouse. When a chicken 
as a chicken. When an elephant has an elephant, it's an elephant. It doesn't change into something else. But evolution says, well, it adapts to, it adapts to our, you know, well, take a tropical snake and put it in Antarctica and see how quick it adapts. Yeah. It's not going to make it. It has nothing to do with that. It's God's plan. It's God's overall plan. Each one after its own kind. It's the fingerprint of God. In Genesis 1, verse 21, it says that God created the great sea monsters. It uses the word sea monsters or sea creatures. And we typically will think of whales or whatever it may be, but could it be? Many people have asked me over the years, well, is, you know, when they talk about evolution, they talk about dinosaurs, so it seems like those two things go together. So is there any, any evidence of dinosaurs in Scripture? Well, there is some, there is some, some Scripture that actually, that actually shows this. This will be, I want you to turn to uh, Job 41. Job 41. You know, when I was doing some research, I, re I, I just found out that they found a fossil that literally had dinosaur skin on the fossil. Now, if it's, you know, 65 million years ago, you ain't going to have the skin on that, on that fossil. They were able to do the research and they go, it just blows their mind because they decided to reject the truth or it's, uh, they're willfully ignorant, then they have to tailor everything to their belief of, of no existence of God. So in Job, there's actually, an, it actually, you can go into this a little deeper. It's actually Job 40, verse 15, is where we'll start, but we'll focus more on 41. But this is what God says to Job. He says, take a look at the mighty behemoth. Now, some translations actually say hippopotamus. And he said, I made it. So God's describing something that he made. And many believe these are descriptions of two types of, there's a, the Leviathan and the behemoth. A land-dwelling and a water-dwelling dinosaur-type creature. And the reason why people throw it out as far as being a hippopotamus is because it says its tail is as straight as a cedar, a cedar tree. So hippopotamuses do not have you know, cedar-sized tails. Because think about it, when things were translated several hundred years ago, they didn't know dinosaurs existed. They just started finding them in the late 1800s. They're called dinosaur, terrible lizard. They go, wow, we had some pretty big creatures that were walking the earth. So at that time, they had no clue that even these, these type of things, these dinosaurs existed. So when we go to, to uh, Job 41, and we'll start at verse 12, it says this. It says, I want to emphasize the tremendous strength in Leviathan's limbs and throughout his enormous frame. Who can strip off its hide and who can penetrate its double layer of armor? Who could pry open its jaws? Its teeth are terrible. The overlapping scales on its back make a shield. They are close to they are so close they are close together that no air can get in between them. They lock together so nothing can penetrate them. Now watch this. This is interesting here. In verse 18, when it sneezes, it flashes light. Its eyes are like the red of dawn. Fire and sparks leap from its mouth. Smoke streams from its nostrils like like steam from a boiling pot or a fire of dry rushes. And yes, its breath would kindle coals for flames that shoot out of its mouth. 22, the tremendous strength in its neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Now, most animals are no, you know, you don't usually think of terror in the neck. When this, I don't know, if you see the gigantic dinosaur and it was looking that way and it decided to look this way, it might be 20 feet closer to you. You know, there was terror that was struck. There was something very enormous about 
what was being described here. Now, I want to go back to, it says, fire coming out of the nostrils. In all legends around the world, there is actually legends of dragons. Chinese legends, Camelot, you know, all those type things. There is something that's called the bombardier beetle, which is an example of how this could possibly work. The bombardier beetle is just a very small beetle. It's common in most of the world. And inside the bombardier beetle, it has two chambers, one on each side. One side's filled with hydrogen peroxide. The other side is another type of chemical. When a predator comes to it, it will repel the predator, whether it's a frog or another insect. Out the back end, it will, sh it will shoot a hot, boiling, almost like a flame, out the back end. So the two chambers, they, they have a smaller chamber in the back, and they can't mix together until it's time to, you know, do away with the predator. So there's another chamber in the back. So this beetle is structured, and as far as evolution goes, I mean, this thing would blow apart. You know, if evolution were true and, you know, it had half of it, it was all mixed together, it would never exist. So you have this kind of thing happening. And notice in Scripture it said, boiling hot. And the description that I seen when I was doing my research was that this beetle would have a boiling hot reaction. It's almost near 210, 211 degrees. So they found some dinosaurs, think about this once, I want to stretch your mind. They have some dinosaurs above the brain area where there's a cavity that is up above the brain that was empty. It was kind of a hollowed out area. Now could it be possible that these two would combust when it breathed, come down through the nasal cap? passages, and then when it snorted or whatever it would do, they would literally be like fire coming out of its nose. Are dinosaurs in Scripture? Yeah, I believe they are. Did God create them? Yes. Was it through evolution? No. Matter of fact, Job probably even seen these. It said that Job, the book of Job is one of the oldest books in Scripture, that he probably seen one of these dinosaurs. Something of this description. See, because if it's millions of years, well, then people didn't exist with dinosaurs. It's a very important, very important point. So you can take a look at that for yourself and think of what type of reptile or what kind of creature that could be. Back in the late 1980s, and I had a picture of it, but I, couldn't, I didn't bring my cord with my iPad to hook up to, to the back so you couldn't see this. But if you look this up, you'll, it'll pop up on Wikipedia. Uh, you look up plesiosaur pulled up by a Japanese fishing boat. And they, there was a Japanese fishing boat out fishing for tuna. And when they pulled a carcass up that had skin on it, and, and if you look at the shape of it, when you pull this up, it, it, it looks exactly like a plesiosaur. It had a type of fins. It had the longer, thicker legs in the back. It had a long neck. And I believe it was about 30 feet high. When they hung it, there was about 30 feet high. The stench was so bad that they took two pictures of it and they threw it off the boat. They came back to Japan and they're like, what did you do? You, you, you threw that back in the... And they went back out to look for it. They could not find it. So this thing had recently died. This is something that could be a, there's a huge blow to evolution, you know, to the fact that Dinosaurs still exist. So is it a freak accident or is, the, is it the fingerprint of God? You know, Paul says to study, to show yourself approved. That we can use our minds and be able to have a conversation with people. And like I said earlier... Uh, well, I'll say it this way. Last year, we went to the Creation Research Creation Museum in Florence, Kentucky. So if you're sick of going to the beach, traveling east three hours, take a vacation and go west about seven hours to the only creation-based museum in the whole world. It's awesome. Yeah. I know Day Spring had taken trips there. And... It's amazing just to see they have through the book of Genesis, Noah's flood, 
It's, it's an incredible. People have just invested in this. There's life-size dinosaurs that have been made. It takes two years, full-size dinosaurs, whatever it is. So it's, been an, it's, it's an amazing trip. And right now, they're actually working on building a two-scale Noah's Ark. It's a $24 million project, and they're building a life-size Noah's Ark, the real deal, the real thing, about 15 miles south of there. Now, two things. What does this have to do when you're speaking to someone or people are going through times of doubt? One of the scriptures says, when a person comes to God, he must believe that he exists and he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I find it interesting, before you believe in God, you need to believe that he exists. Before you believe in what Christ did, you need to believe that God exists. So when a person says, ah, there is no God, then when it comes to what's in the Word, they say, well, this doesn't mean anything, so I choose not to believe this, and therefore, I am accountable to no one. So I make up my own rules. Right and wrong is what I say it is. But when a person begins to think, hey, there is a creator, God, there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever. And this can be, again, in reference to the people that you're speaking to who have doubts about this, to say, now, what does that creator expect of me? And has he left us a guidebook? And he has left a guidebook, and we might not like everything it says in here, but this is the guidebook. Then we have an accountability, we have purpose, that we have the purpose that God has placed in our lives, and we can walk, we can walk out in that. So I believe two things that I want to share. If there's been anyone in this room who's had doubt or anyone who would like to go deeper, I want to do, would like to have the altar team come up. Matt, if you want to, Matt Irwin, wherever you're at, you can come on up with the worship team. Our dirt hasn't moved yet. <laughs> we'll give it a million years, see what happens. But perhaps... You have doubted the existence of God, and you're not sure if he's real. So that you can say, you know what, I want to take a first step after I listen to what's been spoken, and I want to pray with someone. Or you say, you know what, I just, you know, I got saved and I believe in God, but I really haven't gone deeper. So it's two calls, either the doubting or it's going deeper in God. So I really encourage you to do that. I really encourage you to do that research and just be able to begin to study. Well, people say, well, aren't you just talking about science? You know, this is just science, Clint. No, actually, God is in the science. God's in the science. He, he, he did it. It's all him. It's not separate. So we need to study to show ourselves approved. It's not a freak accident. We're not a freak accident. We're the fingerprint of God. So stand up. We're going to sing. And just during this song, if you want to make a decision to say, I want to go deeper, or you know what? I've been doubting, then I want you to pray with someone up front here. The Lord of all creation of water, earth, and sky. 